Thanks for thanks for organizing this really interesting and thought provoking workshop. Um, before I get started, I have a word from our sponsor. Um, and this is specifically directed to astronomers and information scientists who might like to work with astronomers in this audience. And that's that NASA is currently undergoing, uh, so actually, let me preface this. Okay, I, I cast this as an advertisement, but um, if you walk away with one thing from this talk, especially if you're in that audience of astronomers or information scientists who want to collaborate with astronomers, this is the thing you should walk away with um, because I think this is very important. Uh, I hope you'll find something interesting in the science that I'll talk about, but um, this will influence the future of our field. So NASA is currently undergoing a review of its research programs that fund individual investigators, guest investigators. This kind of thing happens about once per decade. Um, and I'm on a panel of uh, astronomers that are advising them, not so much with the actual review of existing programs, but establishing metrics for them. But they're seeking uh, input from the public on uh, what people think of the current state of the program, the way it's, it's, it's been changing over time, and the way they think it should change. And um, let me just point out that um, our field of kind of interdisciplinary work that focuses on methodological research has not fared well in the previous reviews. And, and the consequences of that are in the last few years, some major programs that have funded our work have died. Um, and if you're unhappy with that, this is your opportunity to say something about it to people who are equal here. So I'll show this slide again at the end, in case you want to start it down. But just Google NASA Astrophysics Program Review. Follow this URL to, to make your comments. All right, so now, you know, I hate to talk about money and stuff, but <laughs> that keeps us all doing the fun stuff. And so let's start talking about the fun stuff. So thanks to our friends at Google, this is from the sky view of Google Earth. I uh, have a map here of what the night nice sky looks like at about 9 o'clock looking to the northwest. Of course, you probably won't see most of these stars over Manhattan, but some, some from elsewhere will hopefully see them. And I chose this particular direction in view for uh, a reason, even for people who don't know the night nice sky that well, hopefully you at least know the Big Dipper, which is this asterism or pattern of stars in, in the, uh, the Big Bear constellation. So it's upside down here. And you may know this trick that if you follow the two stars at the end of the Big Dipper, you'll reach the pole star, Polaris, in a little dipper. Um, what I'd like you to do is go a little bit farther to the next kind of visible star. Uh, it's just a little dimmer than the, the pole star. It's called Gamma Cepheus. And it's kind of house-shaped constellation. This view here, these new symbols, these ellipses, show extrasolar planetary systems that we now know. And so I directed you here because this is probably the easiest one to find in the northern hemisphere. So I want, want you to be able to tell your friends on a, when you walk out at night, be able to point to them, uh, you know, an extrasolar planetary system that we now know of. The other reason I chose this map, um, John, really excellent talk, kind of. Set, set up for this is that down at the bottom here, uh, so right at the horizon at about 9 o'clock is the constellation Cygnus, the Northern Cross. It's very easy to find. Um, and as you heard earlier, uh, the field of view of Kepler is uh, in the Northern Cross. In fact, in, in the summer, if you look straight up in the late evening, it'll be a really bright star, Vega. That's very easy to find. It'll be the brightest star overhead. And uh, again, you can point to your friends. You, as John said, you can hold out your hand and you can say, hold it up next to Vega and say, we now know of a thousand solar systems right there, which I think is just remarkable. That's just uh, such exciting stuff um, that Kepler is doing there. So um, as was mentioned, those are our, our candidate solar systems, and astronomers need to do some expensive observations um, to, to, follow, to follow up on those and some of them classified by size, but since John talked about Kepler. So, okay. so what I want to talk about today is uh, how one would go about kind of trying to optimize the use of resources to do the kinds of follow-up required to do confirmation. Um, and it's kind of a, a little bit of a, 
amazing statistics at the, the summer schools and the master statistics that are held uh, in Penn State each summer. And so Carl has this uh, kind of provocative comment, science is more than a body of knowledge, it's a way of thinking. The method of science, as stodgy and grumpy as it may seem, is far more important than the findings of science. <coughs> and one reason I like to, to, to use that to start my course is that I, I think of statistics and the information sciences is kind of the, the, the part of the, the scientific method that we can describe quantitatively with some kind of mathematical precision. So I like to, to try to convince them that people who do this kind of research are kind of doing research in the scientific method, not just in you know, astronomy or particular <coughs> Kind of the school book uh, description of the scientific method that we get is based on what's sometimes called a hypothetical deductive approach. The idea is that you form a hypothesis based on past knowledge or some theory, and you devise an experiment, some kind of monolithic you know, set of observations or tests. You perform it, and then you do analysis, and then you, you iterate this procedure. Um, what this talk is about is trying to build uh, within the experiments step the, the iteration. And so um, one of my colleagues, up with the term Bayesian adaptive exploration for this kind of framework. And this is just a, a very crude kind of flowchart cartoon of the idea. The idea is you have some strategy for doing observations and uh, prior information perhaps from your existing data. And then you implement those observations and you get new data. And then you make inferences based on that new data. Then you make predictions that you use to guide the design of your next observation based on what you've learned from the data. And the idea is to do this online. So it's related to active learning and things like that. But it's, the new piece is that it will be done in a uh, kind of astrophysical and nonlinear model context. So with that, it's kind of the, the teaser introduction. Here's my agenda. So I'll, I'll describe uh, some of what's already been described about discovering exoplanets with radial velocity observations. Then the bulk of the talk will be, I'll try to explain in, in um, kind of big picture terms, the, the theory that underlies this basic adaptive exploration idea. Um, I have a toy problem with some simulated data that's very simple and cartoonish, but if you, if you can see how things work, I think I'm not going to have time to go through it, but um, we'll see if I do. We'll do that. But the main thing I want to get to is at the end I'll show you it in operation uh, for data with the uh, you know, actual real data from all right, so first, uh, just the, the astronomical background. Um, John's talk focused on uh, this transit technique that Ke the Kepler mission is using, where you watch a planet pass in front of its host star. Um, most of the existing confirmed planets, of which there are about 500, um, were detected by uh, looking at the reflex motion of the host star. So the, the, the key idea behind it is that all the bodies in a planetary system orbit. They orbit with respect to the center of mass of the whole system. So we like to tell our, you know, our, our students in elementary school that the planets orbit the sun. But really, the simplest description of the solar system's motion is that all the, the uh, members of the solar system, including the sun, orbit the center of mass of the solar system. So in particular, if you were an observer, 30 light years above our, the plane of our solar system, looking down at it from, from 30 light years away, you would have seen over the past few decades the sun do this kind of complex wobbling dance on the sky. And the, the axes here span plus or minus a thousand micro arc seconds or a milli arc second. So a milli arc second, remember an arc second is a 36 hundredth of a degree, right? So this is a very small motion. Most of this motion is due to uh, Jupiter and Saturn's tug on the sun. Uh, the component of it due to the Earth is one one thousandth of the, the scale of this plot. But the point of this is that the host star of our solar system and of other solar systems move. This is, like, <coughs> this is a plot of the side-to-side -side wobble, but there's also motion along the line of sight if the plane is tipped. And the radial velocity uh, method <coughs> tries to detect that along the line of sight uh, motion, as a measured velocity measured via Doppler shift. So when the host star moves towards us, spectral lines are blue shifted. When it moves away, they're 
this is what the, the, the raw data, so to speak, look like. They're spectra um, with thousands of lines. This is in a shell spectra where there are different borders. Spectra borders that correspond to different color. Uh, the colors can be put on afterwards. Um, many of these lines are actually calibration lines from an, from an eye <coughs> or other cell that's placed in front so you know exactly where lines should lay. And with so many lines, it's capable, and this is a very uh, uh, impressive technological feat, it's possible to measure the uh, locations of the line centers to a thousandth of the width of a spectral pixel. And that, that's astronomers, the astronomers who do this, measure the speeds of objects that are uh, you know, tens of light years away with this kind of velocity, so walking speed, meters per second, of things that are you know, hundreds of trillions of miles away. It's just an amazing technical accomplishment. So the reduced data that people like me get after a very non-trivial analysis like this are velocities as a function of time. And that's the kind of, at the level that I want to talk about, think of things as measurements of, of velocity as a function of time. The times are regularly spaced, and though it's not evident to the eye, in fact, there's a, a periodic signal in here. Not a sinusoid, but a periodic So when you get data like those velocity time series, there's many statistical tasks you like to do. You like to detect planets. You want to see if there's a periodic signal present or if there's more than one present. You, once you've detected them, you'd like to estimate the orbits, so measure periods, eccentricities, um, tilts of orbits. Um, if you, once you have a, a, a system well characterized, you'd like to predict orbits in the future. For example, if there ever is a terrestrial planet finder, we'll want to predict when, uh, you know, when are good times to observe particular systems. Um, or for ground-based transit observations, you'd like to predict when the transit is happening. When you look at many systems, most of the astrophysics actually lies not look in looking at individual systems, but in looking at the population level and trying to see correlations of things that tell you about the planet formation process and you know, stuff like that. So this is actually a problem I'm really interested in. What I'm going to focus on today is optimal scheduling, which is related to all these things, especially to prediction. Um, how can you use limited and expensive resources uh, to address all of these goals by picking observations that will give you the most information? And uh, one of the nice things about addressing all of these tasks within a Bayesian framework is that they, they all, this all gets kind of integrated. They're not, they're not all separate problems. You have to do this to do this, and you can use the output of that directly and straightforwardly to do this and this. So um, that's why we've chosen so let, now let me uh, tell you about this Bayesian adaptive exploration idea. Um, so the basic idea is to talk about designing an experiment or a sequence of observations and thinking of that as a, a decision theory problem. Um, so whenever we perform an experiment, we're, we have choices of actions to, to actually do, things we're going to actually do, behaviors we're going to have, what sample size to use, what times or locations in space to probe, things like that. And we have to make our choices about the properties of the experiment amidst uncertainty about you know, what the data will be, be like and what's the, the, what the nature is like underneath that data. And so we, we'd like to do this in some kind of principled way uh, that will account for all these kinds of uncertainties. Um, so uh, Bayesian decision theory is a, a kind of a general approach for making decisions of any type uh, in in the light of uncertainty. Um, and the key idea behind it, the key additional piece to what you know, most astronomers know about Bayesian statistics, which is this idea of likelihoods and priors, the key new piece in decision theory is that decisions depend not just on what you know about the system, but on the consequences of your actions. So um, the classic example is Russian roulette. If I, if I were to hand you a six shooter that has one bullet in it, you know, spin the chamber, and offer you $100 you know, to, to point it at your head and pull the trigger, you will not act as if the most probable hypothesis is true. Right? Uh, the most probable hypothesis, you know, by odds of, of five to one, is that the, 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 the current chamber is empty. But I think we could all agree it would be a fool who would take the $100. Right? So, so the, the decision you make is not to act as if the most probable hypothesis is true. Something about the consequences of your decision. Uh, uh, 
your actions factors into making decisions. Decisions aren't just about uncertainty, but about consequences. So to deal with that, decision theory introduces these ideas of utility or loss function. So you pair, compare consequences via a utility that gives you the benefits. Of it. it has to be some kind of scale or quantitative measure um, that gives you the benefits of a decision or a loss quantifying the cost. So this is a function of the actions you, you, you'll decide and what the outcome is. So action would be you know, whether I choose to pull the trigger or not, you know, accept the bet or not, and the outcome would be you know, bang or silence. <laughs> so, um, of course, the outcome is a little more serious than noise. So, um, and then for that's kind of the optimistic approach to decision theory. The pessimist might phrase things in terms of a loss. Uh, and so to do this, if you were to phrase the, the Russian roulette problem in decision theoretical terms, you'd have to assign maybe, you know, if, if I offered you $100, you'd have to kind of come up with some monetary value for your life to assign it the, the, the utility that uh, the loss you would incur if you were killed. Um, and presumably that's large enough that it overweighs the fact that, uh, that a bullet being present has a lower probability. All right, so we're uncertain of what the outcome will be. So how do you make a decision between the different, you know, you pick one place in the action space. So the idea is that you average over the possible outcomes, weighting them by their uncertainty. So here's the utility function, you know, whether to accept the bet or not, and then what will have, what the nature will actually hand me in the gun. Um, I, I don't know what that'll be, what those outcomes will be, so I take what I know, calculate a probability for them, and then marginalize that. This thing is called the expected utility, and the best decision is the one that maximizes that. And there's a kind of axiomatic theory about this. It has some kind of conditions on what utility functions look like and stuff like that, but there is a kind of axiomatic basis. So Bayesian experimental design is to phrase the, the choice of experiments as a decision problem in this Bayesian decision. So the actions are just, the action space would just be labels for possible experiments, like choice of a sample size n, or choice of the time to take my next exoplanet RV observation. <coughs> so I'll label my experiments by some, some labels. So the outcomes that I'm uncertain about are what nature will hand me in terms of data from that experiment. I don't know what data I'll get. The utility will measure the value of a particular data for achieving the goals of an experiment. And it might take into account the cost of an experiment. It might be more costly to, to observe at certain times than others. You know, but it might be more co costly to observe during dark time than light time, or things like that. Yes? But on cost and um, yeah. losses? You can talk about it in terms of, yeah, cost could be losses that, that appear as a negative in the utility. Or you could frame it in terms In fact, I'm not going to talk about costs. I'm just going to focus on other terms of this. So the, the idea is you choose the experiment that maximizes the expected utility. You know, so, so the outcome space is the data that may arrive. And what we need to do this calculation is the, the predictive probability for the data as a function of you know, what experiment you choose. Now, to predict the data, we're going to have to consider various hypotheses for the data producing process, like what is the true orbit of a planet? don't know. We have to take that uncertainty into account. So to do this, to, to evaluate this probability, I'm going to introduce the unknown state of nature, H, and then marginalize over that. So I have a, a sum over data to get my expectation of the utility, and then I'm going to have to sum over other hypothesis space to get the predicted probability. So there's a hint of trouble ahead. Um, I've highlighted in red those sum signs that in a continuous space where we usually live, these are integrals. And they are probably, in most cases, but sometimes this might be one dimensional, but almost always this is multiple dimensional. So the, we have to integrate. We have all the problems of doing a normal Bayesian calculation, which involves integrals over hypothesis space. But then we also have the problems of doing a good frequentist calculation, which involves integrals over the sample space. So it's kind of computationally, it's the worst of both worlds. And then in addition, we have to do an optimization over the, the, the E space. So um, the theory I'm going to tell you about actually has existed for about 70 years. But it's only in the last decade or so that people have been 
able to apply it to nonlinear models of, of, of realistic complexities, and that's why you're, you're hearing about it now. Yeah. <coughs> uh, so what utility should we use? So uh, in particular for this for exoplanet observations. So a lot of scientific studies don't have a single clear-cut goal that would let us kind of try to come up with a particular cost. Like we want to know the period and we, you know, we, we want its accuracy to be so and so. Usually, you know, the kinds of experiments we do in astronomy, we have a kind of a broad goal. We just want to learn and explore, and the information we discover will be used for lots of different purposes by different scientists. Um, so, you know, for exoplanets, we, we you might use them the, the, the characterization of a planet to infer the mass of the planet or whether it's in a habitable zone, or you might be interested at the population level, or you might want the information to plan you know, the TPF follow-up. So we're going to try to use a, a general purpose utility. And for that, we turn to uh, information theory. Um, and we're going to measure the information gain provided by new data as a change in entropy. And I'm going to talk here in terms of Shannon entropy, kind of the, the more formally correct thing is to use uh, kullback leibler divergence or a, a Shannon entropy with a, with a measure in it. But this, uh, the answers actually don't change because of the average. So let me just talk about the simpler case. So the, the Shannon entropy, just to remind you, it's a, it's a scalar measure of the degree of uncertainty expressed in our probability distribution. And um, one way to kind of intuitively motivate it is it's an average, so a probability weighted sum of something that, that uh, some people have called the surprise. Um, so just this term here, the log one over p. If the p is if p is small, then this thing is big. So if you see an outcome, uh, an outcome i when p is small, that's a surprise. So that's why this thing is called a surprise. So a very flat distribution with many options, all the p's would be very small, and the average surprise would be very large. So flat distributions have large entries. So uh, if you do the log, it's minus p log. So for a measure of information gain, <coughs> we imagine we have some existing data, big D, and we can calculate our current posterior distribution. And uh, if we get some future data, little d, um, that will presumably shrink our posterior, and we'll measure the information gain from that data as uh, the entropy that we started with minus the entropy that we end up with, which should be smaller. So this number will be positive. So this is a sum of p log p in the in the updated posterior, the, the, the little d here, and minus a constant term. This thing here. So minus x. The, so there's now this, this uh, goes away, and we have a, a plus sum. So this, as I mentioned, this was advocated first advocated you know, over half a century ago. Um, just to make a connection to some things you might already appreciate. The entropy of a Gaussian distribution, or in this case, the information, so the negative entropy, is a minus log of the standard deviation. So a larger sta standard deviation is a, a larger entropy um, or a lower amount of information. Negative. Um, and the multiple dimensions is just the determinant of the covariance matrix. And, but it's not just, it's not a measure of variance or covariance. So for example, these two distributions this one has a much higher variance than this one, but they have the same entropy. Right? The entropy measures kind of the size of the regions that have probability, not, not some kind of metric. Um, so um, we're going to use as our, as our utility the information gain provided by a datum at the new time. So it's just a, if I update my posterior distribution with the new datum uh, and then calculate the entropy in the updated that, that's the so as in, when we were talking at the very beginning with the D is the outcome, we don't know what, you know what data these will hand us, so we have to average over its values of D to get an expected information. This is our expected utility. So that's the integral of this thing, this information, times the predictive distribution. And that predictive distribution is itself a sum over uh, uh, over um, 
the hypothesis that <coughs> we have to take into account the uncertainty in the orbit, for example, and to make predictions about the future. So there's, as I said, there's a heck of a lot of averaging going on, and actually most of the time I've spent on this project is on doing those averaging, and I'm going to spend very little time, just the next two slides, telling you about that research, because <laughs> um, it's kind of grungy, but that's actually where the work is. Um, so there's just a, a couple key ideas I want to communicate on these slides about the computation. So um, let's imagine that I've detected a planet, and I just want to estimate the parameters of that, param of that planet's orbit. So I'm in a parameter estimation set, not the detection problem, but the parameter estimation. So I have some model that there's a planet present. Right it has some unknown parameters, theta, the period of the orbit, the size of the orbit, its eccentricity, and so on. And I have some current data, and that gives me a current posterior distribution, you know, the contours in that space, or points in that space. Um, and then the expected, so, so I'm going to make one further assumption, and that's that the entropy of the noise distribution, the width of my noise distribution at a given time, doesn't depend on uh, a on the parameters of the planet's orbit, which is reasonable. Um, a few lines of algebra, just kind of using Bayes' theorem and an information theory of identity. Uh, you can show that the expected information at a future time is some constant times this integral here. And keep its minus sign and look at what this integral is. So it's an integral of my predictive distribution for the data at the future time times the log of that predictive. So this thing here, including the minus sign, this is the entropy of my prediction at a given time. So remember, entropy gets big when your distribution is uncertain. So this is saying the, 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 the best observing time, the time that maximizes this, is the time for which my predictions are the worst. So it's kind of an intuitively sensible criterion to learn the most, sample where you know the least. So, but how do I actually calculate that integral? So I rewrote it here. Um, so we use a nested Monte Carlo uh, method. So we're going to do a standard, two standard tools for Bayesian inference to get uh, parameter distribution, samples in parameter space by Mark Upton and Monte Carlo today. And then if we know those, then we can both evaluate and sample this predictive distribution with very straightforward uh, kind of Monte Carlo method. So that's this nested Monte Carlo integral. And then to do this posterior, uh, to get these, these parameters, the, the sampling and posterior and of the posterior distribution, uh, we're going to use a property of these exoplanet models, which is that the, if you write out the model, it's a linear sum of, of nonlinear terms. And you can do the linear part analytically, so you can reduce the dimensionality of the model. Um, so we're, we, we separate, basically we separate our variables into some a fast set that we can handle very easily and a slow set where we actually have to do careful MCMC. And we do that using some fairly modern uh, population-based adaptive markup chain money parliament. The one we're using most right now is called differential evolution MCMC. So, I think I do have time to go through this toy problem. So let me just show you it at work on a very kind of silly toy problem. But yeah, you can kind of see the me what the method is trying to do in it. It looks somewhat intelligent, but um, let, let me go through it. So um, here, this, the setup is that there's uh, I'm looking in space at some for some bump. Um, I'm going to sample some, make some measurements at different places in, in space, and I'm trying to de detect some signal that should look like a Gaussian-shaped bump. And I, I don't know the location or the height or the width of the bump. And so here, here's the unknown true values of the location, uh, the pool with half max, and the amplitude. And I'm going to do a scan with a, a, an instrument that has would give me a signal-to-noise measurement of 5 if I were right on top of the peak. Um, and here's the, here's the unknown uh, true object, and here are 11 initial data points. So most of them are too far from the object to do anything. There's, there's really only one that has any substantial signal, um, so there's a little bit I'm going to ask, you know, what, where should I observe next? <coughs> so I'm going to go through that three, each step of that uh, that 
phasing adaptive exploration cycle. So there, there was the observation step that I just did, then there's the interim inferences, and then there's the design step, and I'm gonna go through a couple of cycles. So we just got observations. Now we're gonna have to do interim inferences, so we're gonna do the kind of standard Bayesian thing where we'll, we'll use posterior sampling. So Bayesian uh, inference gives you a probability for your parameters, so a probability for the location, the width, and the amplitude. And I just create a pseudo-random number generator that will give me points in that 3D space. And so here's a set of points, two-dimensional marginals, so location and amplitude, and location and width, uh, just to give you a sense of what's going on there. Um, and there's, all, there's a hint here, and you'll see, see more about it later, that, that there's uh, things are definitely not Gaussian. There's kind of this little clump out here. But, um, I should mention that in the, in the limit where you're dealing with linear models, you can do, even though there's all these layers of integrals and sums, you can do them analytically. So there's a huge literature on this linear case. But uh, part of the reason I'm pointing out the kind of non-Gaussian anity here is that I'm interested in what happens when all that linear stuff can be done. So here's a plot that I really want to uh, we'll spend a minute describing because you're going to see a few of them. So uh, there's two, uh, there's one abscissa, of the location, so choices of the next observation, and there's two, uh, two vertical axes, two ordinates. So these thin, so well, actually the thick uh, dash curve is the unknown true Gaussian, right? It was located around five and had a width of order one. Um, these thin curves here are, um, I took the points that I showed you here, for, for 15 of these points, I just plotted their curves, plotted the Gaussian bump that corresponds to just 15 of the points. So those, these thin black curves are meant to be a visual depiction to you of the uncertainty in my prediction of what, uh, what data I would get if I observe at a different The green curve, which is the, the one curve that you read against the right axis, is uh, the entropy in the, in the predictive distribution. And uh, it basically follows what your eye would guess from the distribution of the, uh, the black curves, where, where their widest is where this thing tends to be. So the black curves are kind of a picture <coughs> of the predictive distribution, and the green curve is, is its entropy. So max end sampling says the next best observing time is that this time right around five. So we simulated a new observation and we get interim, new interim inferences. And as a crude measure of volume, you could just look at the product of the standard deviations in the three directions. And with this one new observation, it's shrunk by a factor of, um, I forget what it was, it was about five or six. <coughs> Which isn't too surprising because you really only had one data. You started with 11 observations, but there were really only one or two. But, but the point is you can see really how, what a non-Gaussian or non-linear problem this is. Um, the posterior is nothing like, nothing like normal. And you can kind of see what's going on by looking again at the predictive distribution here. Our new observation, which, is, which was right near the act where the center roughly is, so the observation was here, and the center is here. It's basically pinned down the curve here, but curves can exist on both sides of that point and with various widths, and that's what causes this kind of uh, horseshoe shape in the posterior distribution. So now uh, the entropy curve is this green curve, and it has this interesting structure. It says you don't want to observe anywhere near where you just observed, but you want to observe a little bit to either side to, to start now constraining instead of the amplitude, the width. And it's slightly better to look on the left, so we do that. <laughs> And we get another shrinkage by a factor of about four um, in, the, in the parameter space. And now, um, you know, it kind of automatically switches to looking on the right. And when you do that point, and you get another factor of uh, about three. Um, if instead of looking at this point, I looked at a point around here, um, I would have instead got these inferences, um, which actually have considerably more volume. The points are all overlapping. It's about or three times larger volume. And they're also, uh, you see that the correlations were highly reduced by using the alpha. So that was just a kind of toy problem where you could see that it's kind of doing the smart thing. It's that it, it figures out on its own that, okay, first I want to try to find the peak, and then once I've nailed that, 
kind of bounded on each side. So now let me show you a, an exoplanet example. Again, I'm going to run through this, this three-step cycle a few times. And I'm going to use real data. So um, the problem with using real data is that you don't know what the truth is. So uh, I, I'll, I'll fudge around that in a way that I'll explain it. <coughs> so here's the real data I'm using. So in 2000, um, Voda et al. reported observations, 24 radial velocity observations of uh, this star from the Henry Draper catalog. It's a star uh, much like the sun, about 120 light years away, um, reasonably bright. And so here's its velocity versus time. Uh, this is time in days. So this is over a period of a few, uh, uh, a few years. So uh, the, the error bars are about the size of the symbols. That's why you don't see error bars. They're actually plotted but they're designed. So clearly, there's something here. And I'm going to treat this as a parameter estimation problem. They, they've already done the analysis. They're convinced there's a planet that actually looks a lot like the velocity curve for an elliptical orbit. Um, and, but I want to say, OK, what's the best time to observe to learn the, the orbital parameters better? All right, so this is just to remind you what the parameters are for uh, uh, the planetary orbit. If you're just interested in the line of sight velocity, there's an orbital period. There's an orbital eccentricity. There's a, an amplitude that's related to the size of the orbit. Um, that's just the amplitude of, velo of that velocity curve. Um, and then there are some geometric parameters involving the tilt of the orbit and its orientation, as well as kind of just the overall velocity that the whole system is moving. So uh, the blue ones, the ones highlighted in blue, are the slow variables. They're the ones that appear nonlinearly that I can't handle in. So it's the period, the eccentricity, and this, this kind of orientation of the orbit parameter called the mean anomaly, because it's an angle. And uh, to make predictions for a given choice of those, you have to solve a very famous nonlinear equation. It's the easiest solve for the famous, very strongly nonlinear equation called Kepler's equation. So it's a strongly nonlinear model. The likelihood function is highly multimodal. It's very, very much of a thing. So here I'm showing you um, output from the MCMC for the the inferences, uh, posterior inferences from that, uh, that initially published data set of 24 observations. So um, this is kind of the standard MCMC scatter plot. So it's just pairwise uh, marginal distributions and then uh, univariate marginal. So this is for period, this is the marginal distribution for the unknown period. This is about um, 55 days wide at about 600 days. So period, eccentricity, and then that angular variable, uh, the mean anomaly. And so there are strong correlations. There are things that break any kind of Gaussian approximation for the eccentricity physically can't be above one. And very typically, you see um, likelihood functions or chi-squared surfaces that peak uh, or are large uh, at that limit, at one limit or the other, zero, a circular orbit, or one. So um, things that involve Gaussian kind of all right, so here's another one of those design plots. I'm going to spend a few times blowing up this and expanding this. So here's this black curve is the, the best fit that was reported, which is also the baby in math or maximum a posteriori estimate. Here's that black curve. Um, the blue curves are, again, I took this time I took 20 points from here, and I plotted their velocity curves. Um, so those are kind of the predictive distribution, a picture of the predictive distribution. And you already see one interesting point that for nonlinear models, the map estimate can actually be very atypical of what of where the posterior probability lies. So the map is an orbit with a fairly low velocity amplitude of a couple hundred. Um, but the typical orbits in the posterior distribution have velocities that are much higher. So it's just a caution that um, when you're in nonlinear models, which was not the Kepler case, uh, that you should be aware of map. And then the green curve, again, is entropy versus time, measured as bits of information gained, measured as it versus repeating the last measurement. And so uh, there's this nice big peak here of many bits, five bits. Remember, a bit means shrinking your volume by a factor of two. So that's a huge information <coughs> from a single observation. Um, now, let me blow, blow up that last region. Um, 
in the with the magenta points at a few times, I plotted um, actually all the, the orbits instead of just the 20. So you can see some of the structure in the predicted distribution. The point being that the predicted distributions are also very non-normal. Some of them are bimodal. Um, they typically are very skewed. So this is just a problem that you don't want to do with the kind of existing linear model. I also calculate the entropy curve out to the distant future, just to show you that it kind of does the sensible thing. Right? As, uh, as you go far enough into the future that your, your phase uncertainty, your orbital period uncertainty makes you lose phase, then there starts to become no time to be preferred over any other time. And so you can see the peaks in the entropy curve are shrinking and kind of approaching something constant. Actually, I think it's not trivial what will happen later. All right, so uh, a few years ago, that same team went back and reobserved this system, and they got 13 new points. So I plotted, uh, based on the earlier observations, the predictions and the entropy curve. So that's the, the predictions are the velocity versus time and the entropy curve in green. And the red dots are the new, the new data points. The lines just show the time. So you can see uh, the majority of them were at times that actually are weren't very informative, so there, there were a few that um, happened to be at pretty informative times, one, two, and this one also. So we don't know what the truth is for the system, but so here's the game I'll play to try to just get some sense of whether uh, BAE, that, the, this adaptive exploration, would have had something to offer. I'm going to use the best fit that they recorded at the end using all 13 new observations. I'm just going to consider that to be the truth for the purposes of simulating other observations that might have been taken. So what I'm going to do is, one at a time for three cycles, I'm going to take new simulated observations from the best fit and, and see what would have happened if you stuck to the, if the optimal time. So the, the next optimal time will be here. The next one won't be here, because I'm going to update with the information I gained from that observation. I'll get a new green curve, but probably somewhere close to there. And I'm going to iterate that. So here's my, uh, uh, what I showed you earlier, the starting point. Uh, we'll, we'll take a, a new observation, and here's from one new op uh, optimal observation, uh, that's how much things shrink. So the product of the standard deviations is reduced by a factor of two and a half from one new observation added to, to 24. Uh, it's a really kind of complex structure, it's actually here, you bimodal. So we're going to uh, do it again. We'll take another further observation. Things sh shrink again quite a bit. Uh, the product of standard deviations shrinks by one and a half times. And then the third one, and I, I don't have an intuitive explanation why this suddenly happens. It actually, in, in some simulations, this doesn't always happen. But um, for this case that it happened to be the first one we ran with real data, the third optimal observation shrinks the uncertainty by a factor of 30. One additionally optimally planned observation. And so I'll compare this with the uh, phasing from the full posterior if you look at all the observations. Um, and the point is from those three optimally cho chosen observations, you could have gotten a posterior that was seven times smaller in volume than the one found with the 13 non optimal and this is the only case we've done. This was just the first one we chose. And so I have no idea how typical these numbers are, except to say that in simulations, with simulated data, they're not too similar. Um, so that's pretty much, that's my story. Um, I just want to summarize a, a bit of outlook on what the op open issues are and the ongoing work in this is. Um, we, we, part of our reason of, of trying to uh, you know, do this fast, slow variable separation, use advanced NCMC techniques, because we want to get into more complex scenarios um, dealing with multiple planets where there are more parameters, so you really need to, to have a better uh, posterior exploration. And we also want to handle the case where there are uh, the, the majority of stars have, have, do not have detected planets. And uh, we'd like to quantify what we know about them. Are we sure that there's no planet there you know, of a given mass, or you know, how probable is it? So we'd like to do a full Bayesian calculation when there's marginal data. That means those cases are cases with lots of important modes, and so uh, it's hard to do them. 
exploring other MCDC algorithms. I, I showed you an example where we were doing parameter estimation. Um, we'd also like to do this adaptive exploration where we don't even know if there's a planet there. It turns out that's actually where we've spent most of our time, and we don't have a working solution to it yet. It's a much harder problem. So we have come up with a, a, a total entropy criterion that kind of smoothly moves between trying to optimize to detect, and then once the evidence builds up on you know, a one planet or a two planet model, it kind of smoothly shifts over to the parameter estimation case that I already described. But the, the problem, there's two kind of computational hurdles. The first is that that max end sampling that I showed you, uh, which I should have mentioned, you know, then oh, removed a layer of integration, that is no longer valid. So we get a whole other set of dimensions we have to integrate over. And then this involves these intervals, these things called marginal likelihoods in Bayesian calculation, integrals over the whole parameter space. The normalization constant for the posterior actually appears when we do this planet detection case. And those are hard to compute. That's actually where we spend a lot of time. And then finally, I showed you a greedy design where I always ask, what's the one next best observation? And there's no theory for this, but what's known about model comparison is that usually non-greedy designs where you jointly plan multiple observations tend to do better. And I don't know of any intuitive explanation for that. Um, so just in closing, I want to uh, mention my collaborator. So David Chernoff, a, a fellow astronomer at Cornell, is the one who got me interested in this problem, and, and we've worked on it together. And this has been collaborative work with statisticians at Duke, um, Marie Spide and Jim Berger, and, and two postdocs who've done really good work, especially on marginal likelihood computation. And that's my story. And let me just close again with the, the, the most important thing to walk away with. Please say something to NASA if you, if you want uh, uh, methodological research to be funded. Say something to them. Thank you. Thinking about your uh, 
that example, and I thought to myself that the, the, the opposite of that is many people who play the lottery. That's the case where people they, uh, they don't think about the odds at all. <laughs> well, actually, so, so there's actually pe people who, you know, as you might imagine, decision theory plays a much more prominent role, role in econometrics than in astrophysics. <laughs> and uh, so one of the things they struggle with is what is the utility of money? Is it its dollar value? And it usually isn't. Like for people, if you actually try to use this theory to study the behavior of people, um, larger values of money do not have utility that's proportional to the amount of money. If you, if you have a million dollars, you might not care about losing 10,000. If you have a thousand dollars, you really care about losing 100, right? Um, so there's that difference. And then, so for understanding the lottery, there's also the fact that, you know, there's people gain some kind of entertainment benefit from it. And you want the utility to reflect that. But I, I agree with your premise, though, that you, playing the lottery is fundamentally an irrational <laughs> decision. <laughs> from the, from the decision. But it caused me to think about what, going back to the last question, yeah. is that I don't think the way we this stuff is how our magic factory plays yeah. at the time people make the work. Ashish Mahal and do we're doing these kind of uh, calculations of what's the most, what's the best next observation of a given transit to determine what it is. Like, so, for, so it's not just the properties of the, of the astrophysical properties of the observation that is, it's is it a gamma ray burst or a supernova or a nova or a transiting planet or a micro-transiting planet. What's the next best thing? <coughs> Nail back that. Well, what's the next best thing among the set of observatories that exist that I can use right now? And so it's really a combination of observing facility and that those capabilities, for example, spectroscopy like or photometry or whatever, uh, against the question that you need to have answered to best narrow down the class of an object. So there's the and choice. this is actually going to feed very deeply and heavily in. Uh, for example, the LSSD project, where we're going to have 100,000 transits every night right, that we just can't feed 100,000 emails to your inbox and hope that you would do some quality mm -hmm. observation for it. We need to have some better, more realistic yeah. estimates of what are the best things to do to really determine what this ought to do. So that will be interesting to see here. Okay. Thank you for saying that. Is there in any way something in this methodology where you can identify false positives? Like um, something that looks like a orbit right. but it's not. And right. So this, this is actually something so this is something that I've, I've Wondered about, and I don't know any. So, um, with that. But, so like, one one of the things that I worry about. Uh, part of what I liked about this problem is that uh, exoplanetary systems with radio velocity data. Uh, there's a model that's just it's just outstandingly good. It's not you know when we talk about this to statisticians, the reason people like Jim Berger and Mer Merlis Clyde like to work on this is that you know it's a it's a place where parametric modeling is sound. <laughs> you know, in most of the world that statisticians work in, parametric models are really fictions. And um, so the fact that inferences in general, but Bayesian inferences in particular, are so conditional on the model uh, you know, is a kind of conceptual issue. But here, you know, we really know what orbits look like, especially if there's only one thin planet. Um, so the reason that this works so well here is because of that. But there, are, one can imagine settings where there can be unanticipated things. And, and my worry is, can you kind of get painted in a corner where, you know, for the hypotheses you've chosen to account for, they'll force you to observe in places that will lead you away from serendipitous discoveries of things you haven't explicitly modeled. Um, and I don't know what to do about that, except you know, have some kind of defensive model included among your options, you know, kind of non-parametric. There might be something there I didn't anticipate and, and put that in. That's a good question. You know, whether, whether, you know, what about the things you haven't explicitly? Yeah, because I, I have explored this for 